On behalf of the National Archives and Records Administration, I welcome you to our Becoming America Lecture Series. This is the fourth of 18 lectures scheduled at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. As one of only 14 presidential libraries operated by the National Archives and Records Administration, the subject of how America came to be, how we gained and secured our freedom and created self-government is the essence of our mission. We believe that access to and education about our government allows Americans to understand their history so they can fully participate in shaping our future. This lecture is the brainchild of Dr. Joellen Chatham, the director of, Center, of the Center for Civics Education at Concordia University in Irvine. She and her colleagues have worked tireless, tirelessly to craft an educational and entertaining lecture series that we hope you will enjoy. Lectures will last 45 minutes with a question and answer format following. Please email me your questions at rachel.fisher at nara.gov or if you are joining us in the audience today and have a question, please reach out to one of our staff members here on site. Now, please help me in welcoming Dr. Joellen Chatham. Thank you, Rachel. And our great thanks, as always, to the National Archives here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Um, they've just, you talk about being tireless. They're here doing all of this work, and we appreciate it very much. Um, we're going to uh, try to cover about four months in 45 minutes to an hour. So let's hope we can take this journey through the Constitutional Convention. Um, we've covered um, in previous lectures, as she said, this is the fourth, we've covered how we became British, we moved from being British to becoming Americans. We did a deep dive into the Declaration of Independence, a critique of the Articles of Confederation, and how that did not help to create the American Union that we all wanted at that time. But now we're going to look at the Constitutional Convention. The Articles of Confederation had failed us, and a new document, a new form of government had to be created. There had been earlier attempts at union in the United States, going back as far as 1643, the Articles of Confederation of United Colonies of New England. Um, the, this was a failed attempt, but it was an early attempt for the colonies to unite for purposes of mutual self-defense and collaboration. A few years later, 1697, a plan of union, which included Boston, Connecticut, and Rhode Island was spelled that way at the time. It was different. New York, the New Jerseys. And again, it was tried to, to come together to resolve complaints and issues among them. The Albany Plan, 1754, proposed by Benjamin Franklin, that would have tried to bring the colonies together under some sort of unified, if not a full government, at least a, a sort of a self-government, um, with uh, the president, a general of this organization to be appointed by the king. It could make treaties and tax. It was a really a precursor to the union that we found in 1781 under the Articles of Confederation. Notice it was the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. It certainly was not a perpetual union, but it was mostly for, uh, for mutual agreement and working together. It took five years for the Articles of Confederation to actually be adopted. It was almost like a treaty among the 13 colonies to help get them through the Revolutionary War. But there was a fatal flaw. As Noah Webster said, and if you remember Noah Webster, who was um, Webster's Dictionary, he was a, a, a great leader and studier of language and of education. But Noah Webster observed, so long as any individual state has the power to defeat the measures of the other 12, our pretended union is but a name and our confederation a cobweb. We spent some time looking at the Articles Confederation. We also spent some time in a previous lecture looking at the causes of disunion, the inadequacies of the Articles themselves, the inability of the 13 states, the independent states now after the revolution, to establish some sort of a coherent foreign policy. The states were encroaching on each other. In fact, they were actually different culturally, sometimes referring to my country, 
meaning Virginia or Georgia or North Carolina. There was a lack of national currency. There were unstable majorities in the state governments that led to conflict and instability in the individual states. Economic stability, which finally found its way into Shays' Rebellion. And James Madison in 1787 actually wrote a document called The Vices of the Political System of the United States. All of these causes of unity carried over into the convention of 1787. This convention took place in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. This was the largest city in the United States had about a population of about 40,000. New York City was the second largest state, just slightly under 40,000. So we're not talking about a big city here. Most of the cities in Orange County, California, from which we're broadcasting, most of those cities have populations bigger than the city of Philadelphia in 1787. Situated along the uh, Delaware River, there were wharves, there were shipping, there was all kind of commerce going on. In this small city, there were at least uh, 10 newspapers and 12 printers, or 25 printers. The newspapers were printed and circulated, but they were also read on the corner where people could listen to the news being read. Um, there were museums in Philadelphia. There were many stores. There were some mansions. There were a number of churches, approximately 170 taverns. Now, don't think of a tavern like we today, today which is kind of like a bar. Uh, this is more of a tavern where people would sit and eat. Um, it's like a public house. They would eat and drink and visit, but more than 170 of them. It was actually the cultural center of the United States at that time. Some streets were actually paved, some were lighted, and there was a library originally founded by Benjamin Franklin, Peel's Museum, an arboretum and other attractions in the city. Nevertheless, 40,000 people. The events themselves of the, con of the convention took place in Independence Hall. Although it was not known as Independence Hall then, it was the Pennsylvania State House. But it was already a place of history. This is where George Washington was first made general of the Army of the Continental. Uh, this was the building that hosted the First and Second Continental Congress. This is where the Declaration of Independence was voted on. This is where independence itself was voted on. Common Sense, the great um, uh, discussion of freedom written by Thomas Paine was published here. Um, this particular city, Philadelphia, meaning this building itself, was actually occupied by the British during the war from September of 1777 until about July of 1777. Um, 78. And while the British were enjoying the winter in our major city, George Washington and his troops were encamped at Valley Forge in that terrible winter, only 22 miles away. This was also the place of another historic visit that would take place um, more than a, a, a half century later. In 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was on his way to Washington, D.C. from Springfield, Illinois, on his way to his inauguration, he stopped in Independence Hall, and already this place was revered for what had been done here, what had taken place here. And Lincoln stood, and this is recorded for history. He stood in this room that is to, to my right, your left, and he said, I would rather die here on the spot than give up the principles that were founded in this place. Well, five years later, in 1865, Washington visited that room again. I'm sorry, Lincoln visited this place again. Unfortunately, this time he was on his way from Washington, D.C. back to Illinois to be buried. This time he was in a coffin. And those words seem almost prophetic as we look back to 1860. And he was um, lay in state here for several days and about 80,000 people passed through to see him. So it was a very important place, not only in today's history, but at history a hundred years ago and before that. Who were the delegates who attended? Well, this is an interesting group of people. Um, first of all, 74 had been selected by the individual states to attend. Some refused to attend. Others didn't have the resources or just didn't have the interest. But at the end, all told, 55 delegates from 12 states attended. 
39 ended up signing the Constitution, not that others who were there but uh, didn't sign, they just didn't, did not happen to be there that the day they signed it. Um, George Washington was the first to arrive. He had left Mount Vernon several days before, and on his way, everywhere he went, he was stopped, and they had dinners and banquets and parades and everything to hail him. But he, uh, he um, arrived on May 13th, uh, and I made an error. It was Madison who was the first to arrive. Madison actually got there two weeks ahead of time, checked in at Martha House's boarding house, and he spent the entire time just studying and preparing. For several weeks before that, he had been at George Washington's home at Mount Vernon, where he had been preparing and having many conversations with about Washington, and also encouraged Washington to actually attend the convention. Washington didn't want to come. First of all, he was through with public life. Secondly, if this didn't turn out well, he didn't want to be associated with a failure. But James Madison and General Knox, who had been a general under Washington during the war, persuaded him that the only way this convention would be successful if he were to attend. So he did. Um, and when he arrived in Philadelphia on May, uh, May 13th, he was met by three generals, two colonels, two majors, and all under his former command. He was escorted from Gray's Ferry by the Philadelphia's Light Horse Brigade. Uh, there were cheering citizens, there was cannon, church bells. You would have thought it was the 4th of July. Robert Morris, who was known as the financier of the revolution, who had a lot to do with helping to raise money during that time, had the loveliest uh, home in Philadelphia, and he invited George Washington to stay in that home throughout the convention. Uh, once settled in, the first thing that Washington did that evening was to go to the home of Benjamin Franklin and meet with him. Benjamin Franklin was not just an American star, he was an international star, not because he was a sweet little old man, but because he was recognized as a brilliant scientist, recognized by um, philosophical and scientific societies throughout Europe. He was now 81 years old. He was feeble. He was troubled with gout and gallstones, but he was the second most important person at this convention. And as soon as Washington arrived in Philadelphia, got settled in at the Morris home, he went to visit with Dr. Franklin. Now, who were these 74 men, 55 actually attended, and 39 who signed? Well, 44 of them had served or were already serving in the Continental Congress. About half of them had served in either the Continental Army or the state militia. Eight of these men had signed the Declaration of Independence, and most of them were already involved in state or local government. Many had helped to draft their state constitutions, so that this was not an unfamiliar exercise to them. James Madison knew that there should be a record of this convention. However, as we'll see in a minute, um, the convention was closed to the public, and the only notes that were kept by the secretary were basically, here's the motion, and here's how the states voted yes or no. Madison knew we needed much more, which is why he positioned himself where he did in the convention hall so that he could take these notes. He took the notes copiously, and every night he would go back to Martha House's boarding house, and he would go over them. He would rewrite them, or he would fill in uh, things that he possibly had forgotten. Years later, he also reviewed those notes and edited them somewhat, but those notes were kept private for almost 50 years. They were not published until after he died, and he wanted them published. They were published um, 50 years later in 1840. Um, and by the way, Madison outlived all of the other members of the Constitutional Convention. He died at age 86. Fortunately for history, and fortunately for us, his wife, Dolly Madison, had the presence of mind not only to save the picture of George Washington when the British burned down the White House in 1814 during the War of 1812, but she also knew about her husband's notes, and she secured those notes and saved them. Uh, Madison wasn't in town when the White House was burned, but Dolly remembered those notes and she saved them. 
So the convention actually was supposed to begin on May 14th. Unfortunately, there was not a quorum. Now, a quorum was supposed to be a majority of the states attending. There were 12 states. She said, well, what about, or what about 13? Rhode Island decided not to show up. So you needed a quorum of, thir of, of 12, a majority of 12, which would be seven. And then you had to have a majority of the delegates from that state. Um, one state had eight delegates, another one had five delegates. But in order for them to proceed, you must have a majority of the delegates from that state and then a majority of those in attendance. Well, on the first day when they, uh, when they met on May 14th, North Carolina had a couple of delegates, Delaware had a couple of delegates, um, Virginia had some, Pen Pennsylvania had some. They should have, after all, it was taking place in their state. But unfortunately, they didn't all live in Philadelphia. It wasn't until May 25th that they actually had a quorum. And there were 25 delegates in attendance. And the average daily attendance during the convention was about 30. It was also terribly rainy that day, which made tempers rise a little bit. I think almost as important as who was there is who was not there. Thomas Jefferson wasn't there. He was in France. He was our representative to France. John Adams, who wrote basically the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, was not there. He was representing the United States in England. John Hancock wasn't feeling well. He was the governor of Massachusetts. John Jay, Sam Adams, John Marshall, Patrick Henry, they weren't there. Some chose not to be, or some like Patrick Henry, who had been elected to the convention, decided not to attend because, as he said, he smelled a rat. And he would be one of the largest opponents of the Constitution after it went to ratification. As I mentioned earlier, one state simply refused to attend. They actually voted, we will not be there. They called themselves Rhode Island, but George Washington and others began to call them Rogue Island. Washington was not pleased that Rhode Island refused to show up and he let it be known. Um, the Pennsylvania Mercury, on the day that the convention began to begin its deliberations, actually published excerpts from the first of John Adams' three-volume Defense of the Constitutions of Government of the United States of America. So while Adams was not in attendance, his writings were certainly there. If there was anyone underrepresented geographically at the convention, it was some of the um, uh, western parts of the various states. On May 28th, um, the delegates continue to arrive. In fact, they will continue to arrive for weeks. But Benjamin Franklin showed up, and you'll see him in his sedan chair. This was kind of a popular mode for wealthy people in Europe, and some wealthy people in New York and, and Pennsylvania had these as well. Um, his had glass windows, and this uh, you see an, an artist's rendering to, the, to my right, and then you see the exact uh, chair that Franklin used when he was in um, Philadelphia. It had glass windows, and when he came each day to the convention hall or to Independence Hall for the convention, he was carried because it was carried by, um, by, by people, it's a sedan chair, and these were prisoners from the local jail. Uh, every day, they would read the credentials of any new members that had arrived, and there was only one sour note kind of in all of those credentials, as George Reed from Delaware noted, that those from Delaware were prohibited from changing the articles in the Confederation, establish an equality of votes among the states. Basically, the instructions were to the delegates were to um, amend the articles of Confederation to make them work for all 13 colonies. But the credentials from Delaware had one provision, you cannot support anything that will make the states unequal. Well, one of the first things they had to do was establish the rules of the convention. I've already mentioned the requirement for a quorum, but each state would be allowed allotted one vote. Whether you had eight delegates attending or five or four, whatever one attending, each state would have one vote, and they would vote each day from north to south. And they would be voting by state. So if you had eight delegates from Pennsylvania and they disagreed among themselves, 
Well, however, a majority of those delegates would vote. That's how Pennsylvania would do. Each state was allotted up to seven delegates. Uh, they used committees, and using committees became extremely important, and members were to speak through the chair. They didn't look at each other and speak at each other. And if you watch the Congress in session today, that same rule applies. You speak not to each other directly, but you speak through the chair. And then there was the rule of secrecy. Um, today, this would never happen. We would never have a convention where the press were not allowed. But had the press been allowed or had this been open to the public in 1787, this convention would never have been successful. Years later, James Madison said, no constitution would ever have been adopted by the convention if the debates had been made public. And one of the, um, it was one of the first few weeks of the convention, there was a very interesting incident that one of the delegates wrote about. He said that George Washington, the presiding officer, spoke to speak from the chair. And here's what he said. I am so sorry to find that some one member of this body has been so neglectful of the secrets of the convention as to drop in the state house a copy of their proceedings, which by accident was picked up and delivered to me this morning. In other words, somebody had been taking notes and they dropped them. I must entreat, gentlemen, he said, to be more careful, lest our transactions get into the newspapers and disturb the public repose by premature speculations. I know not whose paper it is, but there it is. And he watered it up and he threw it on the table. Well, interestingly, um, no one picked it up. And one of the delegates, William Pierce, wrote in his notes, uh, he was very concerned because when he felt in his own pockets, he couldn't feel his notes. He was afraid to go look and see if, gosh, was that one of his? When he got back to his room, he was very pleased to find out he, his own notes were not on that table, they were in his room. But this whole concept of secrecy was really important because it allowed members to speak without being quoted. It allowed them to change their minds. It allowed them to put out speculative ideas that may not have been popular, but they could speak freely without fear of any kind of public condemnation. Then you say, well, then how come they knew that Madison was taking those notes? There was a trust. And people knew what Madison was doing. They trusted him that those notes would not become public, at least for a very long time. So we have May 29th. Business finally gets underway. First of all, they elected Nathaniel Gorham as chair of the Committee of the Whole. Now, what's the Committee of the Whole? Well, when you have a convention meeting, George Washington is the presiding officer. He was elected president. Um, he would preside over the meeting. But that's a formal proceeding. If they would operate as a committee of the whole, the procedures were much less formal. The votes taken were preliminary votes. They could change the votes. People could change their mind. It was much less cumbersome, but it needed a chair. And so they elected Nathaniel Gorham. Then when they would go back into the formal meeting of the convention, George Washington would preside again. Um, and on this day, May 29th, the business of the convention really got underway. Edmund Randolph of Virginia stood up and he said, I want to propose a plan. Now, you would have thought the first order of business was, what's wrong with the articles? But no, the first order of business was a document that James Madison had created and was given to his colleague, Edmund Randolph from Virginia, to propose. Now, he did begin by listing some of the defects in the articles, such as the commercial discord, foreign debts, the havoc of having no common currency, the violations of treaties, and so on. So he went through some of those. Those, those things were obvious. But then he proposed a plan. And the plan would be a national legislature with two houses. Each house would be apportioned according to population. One would be elected by the people. The other would be elected by the state legislatures. The national legislature could pass laws, which the, competent, the states were really incompetent to do. The national legislature could veto state laws. You can imagine how controversial that became. 
the national legislature could call out the militia against states who were failing to fulfill its duties under the Constitution. If you remember, during the Revolutionary War, the, Confe uh, the Continental Congress could not tax, they could not raise an army, they could only ask the states to send money and to send soldiers. Under this plan, the states could be forced to, and they could call out the militia against the states if they did not. It called for a national executive, a national judiciary, and the three branches of the new government would be bound by oath to support these new articles. So Randolph moved that they go into the Committee of the Whole and to begin to discuss this plan. When they moved in the Committee of the Whole, George Washington would sit down and he would go sit with the Virginia delegation. They discussed this plan from May 30th until June 8th. And they're finding areas of agreement, areas of disagreement. And then on June 9th, we begin to get a little bit of a problem, although there were other problems, but now we have a big problem. William Patterson from New Jersey, a small state, Virginia was a big state, Massachusetts was a big state, Delaware was a small state. You begin to see this disagreement between the small and large states. William Patterson spoke up and he said proportional representation struck at the heart of the small states. He said giving Virginia or Pennsylvania, large states, representation in Congress simply because they had more population was like saying that, quote, a rich individual citizen should have more votes than a poor one. And Patterson warned, if we do this, we are establishing a single nation and all the distinctions between the states will be abolished. And then he announced, New Jersey will never confederate on the plan before the committee. She would simply be swallowed up. James Wilson, Pennsylvania, large state, said this, the general from New Jersey is candid in declaring his, append uh, his opinion. In other words, I'm glad you're being honest. But then he said, I commend him for that. I say again, however, I will never confederate on his principles. If no state will part with any of its sovereignty, it is vain to talk of a national government. And he said, everything depends on this. This was the issue. The waters had been stirred up and would not be easily pacified. Two days later, the, con the Committee of the Whole began to vote on the Randolph resolutions. There were many votes. New Jersey and Delaware were on the losing side of almost all of them. Most of them passed and were ready to go to the convention floor for approval formally by the convention. In the meantime, Patterson had been lobbying his other small state delegates as well as some of the members of the large states. As James Madison said, Patterson was creating serious anxiety for the results of the convention. In other words, this guy's stirring up trouble. Patterson then suggested maybe we should have equality in the lower house, but in the upper house of the legislature, have equality in the Senate. That was basically voted down and not really considered very seriously. So on June 15th in the convention, Patterson took the floor again. This time he submitted nine resolutions known here as the New Jersey Plan, and that is a picture of, of uh, William Patterson. He agreed the articles need to be revised, and they need to be revised to be adequate to the exigencies of government and preservation of the Union. He even supported a form of national taxation, but in proportion to the population of the states, and in this he made an important statement. He said, in proportion to the whole number of white and other free citizens and inhabitants and three-fifths of all other persons. So number one, white citizens, three-fifths of other persons. This was for taxation. This was not particularly surprising because this was in the Articles of Confederation, this formula. But later on, it will be a formula for something else. He agreed to an executive. The size and authority would be unspecified, but removable by Congress. He agreed that there should be a federal judiciary limited to federal matters. 
Um, at this point, John Lansing from New York stood up and he complained. He said, the powers of this convention are being exceeded. We are here to modify the articles, and now we've got the New Jersey plan, we've got the Virginia plan. This is going beyond what we were told to do. James Wilson from Pennsylvania, who was one of the most active members of the convention, said, with regard to the power of the convention, I conceive myself authorized to conclude nothing, but to be at liberty to propose anything. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, we're here, we can propose anything. And then Governor Randolph, who had authored the, uh, or off, uh, offered the resolutions for the Virginia plan, said, when the salvation of the Republic is at stake, it would be treason to our trust not to propose what we find necessary. The present moment is favorable and is probably the last that will ever occur. In other words, this is it. We've got to come to something now. Now, to make matters a little more complicated, a day or two later, Alexander Hamilton showed up. He was from New York, along with two other delegates. He kind of threw a wrench into the works because he said, well, I don't like either plan. And he proposed his own plan. And he spoke at length, and really wearying the other delegates. But he proposed a concept kind of based on the British monarchy where one branch of government would be elected, elected for life, and the executive would be elected, again, elected for life. And when asked how all of this was a Republican form of government, he basically said, well, we're, we're, we're electing them, but they can be for life. Well, his whole concept was dismissed. People just basically ignored him, um, but it kind of tainted him. Later on, people were saying that he had monarchical tendencies, and after this, um, the next day, Alexander Hamilton went back to New York, but he did return later on in the convention. But still, nothing was settled. On June 19th, they voted on both plans, the New Jersey plan for the small states, equality of states, was again defeated. Madison was upset, James Wilson was upset, it was, can't we get on with it? Why do we have this division? And then Madison said, government, is it for men or imaginary beings called states? So it gets back to popular government versus the role of the states. James Wilson actually told the small states, you might as well form your own federation. And Gunning Bedford from Georgia, which was a small state, said, if the small states have no alternative but the Virginia plan, they will find some, and I'm quoting here, they will find some foreign ally of more honor and good faith who will take them by the hand and do them justice. Luther Martin at this point said, we were on the verge of dissolution. Gares held together by the strength of a hair. Robert Sher uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut said, we are now at full stop. And nobody, he supposed, meant we should break up without doing something. In other words, they were at their wit's end. George Washington kept a diary. Many of them kept diaries. Many of them also wrote letters. And while they did not divulge the proceedings of the convention, you could hear their anguish at how frustrated they were that nothing could get done. And Washington said this, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the proceedings of our convention and do therefore repent having had any agency in the business. But to prove secrecy was working, at that same time, the Independent Gazetteer in Philadelphia wrote this in the newspaper, the greatest unanimity subsists in the councils of the Federal Convention. So obviously, secrecy was working. So finally, on July 2nd, they said, we've, we've got to do something. So they established a committee, one person, from each state, and they said, you guys get together, just, just the 12 of you, the 11 of you, and you decide, you come up with some kind of a proposal here. So they said, we've got a 4th of July recess, and by the way, they all went out and supported the 4th of July, just like we do today, but the committee worked over the weekend, and on July 2nd, um, they voted to take the recess for the 4th of July um, celebration, and that night they had dinner at Benjamin Franklin's house and began the work next day. 
But that night at Ben Franklin's house, he said, why don't we have the house be composed of people based upon the population of the states and the Senate be based on equality of the states? Well, that had come up before, but was basically ignored. And then Franklin had another idea. And to protect the small states even more, have all money bills originate in the House of Representatives. So taxation policy will originate where it's closest to the people. So several days later, July 5th, Madison and Wilson were furious when the report came out. In fact, Madison said, don't be deceived from the small states who are trying to break up the Union. Wilson, who had earlier said that he, he felt the convention was open to anything, now Wilson is saying, well, the committee exceeded its powers. So there, there's a lot of turmoil going on here. But in, final, in the final result, this is what they came up with. You can see the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. One was supported by big states, one by small states. The Virginia plan said two houses. The New Jersey plan said one house. One said one house elected by the people, the second to be elected by the first house. The New Jersey plan is no, they've got to be equal, and it was a unicameral legislature. The number of Congress members determined by population no, each state has to have the same. But the, the great compromise that was finally worked out, was what we know today, and it sounds so simple, it sounds simple to us because we didn't have to argue the position of the large states versus the small states, and we didn't have all of this baggage of disunion behind us. But we ended up with a two-house legislature. A House of Representatives would be based on population. The Senate would be based on equality of states and each state uh, would have two senators. Now, just to give you an idea of just one, one way they went through these arguments, because they did argue, and voices were raised at times. But here's just an example. I mentioned already on June 11, they voted and kind of ignored the equality of states idea. But on July 2nd, uh, they started to reconsider it, and here's why it did not die. The New Jersey plan, or the equality of states plan, still suffered defeat. It was a vote of five, five to one. You say, well, wait a minute, that's 11. Was this, if a state wasn't represented that by someone, they couldn't vote. So this was a five, five to one, but you need seven, a majority of those, to prevail. Luther Martin, now follow this carefully, Luther Martin from Maryland voted yes but he was the only Maryland delegate there that day. The other Maryland delegate, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, which is a very unusual name, he was late, he missed the vote. But had he been there, he would have voted no, uh, no and Maryland would have been in the divided category, not yes, not no, but divided. Then Abraham Baldwin of Georgia shows up. Remember I said they voted from north to south? Georgia was the southernmost state, so it always voted last. And as they were going through this vote, they were voting exactly the way they had done on June 11. Now this is you know, July 2nd. Um, but Abraham Baldwin um, was the only delegate from Georgia there that day with one other colleague. Baldwin was important because even though he was from Georgia, He'd only lived in Georgia for three years. He had been born and raised in Connecticut. He had a broader perspective than some other Georgians. Two of the other Georgian delegates had left the day before. They were members of the Confederation Congress, which was meeting in New York. So they went back to New York. That left um, Abraham Baldwin and William Houston, the other one from Georgia, to vote. Abraham Baldwin before had voted against the small state position, as had Houston, but today, on this day, Baldwin changed his vote, making Georgia divided. So now you have two states that are divided, preventing the large states from having a majority. Now what makes it more interesting is that by this time, Daniel of, of St. I forget his, he's got the craziest name in the world, it's Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer. He shows up, but he had missed the vote. 
So Rufus King says, well, let, well let's, let's vote again so he can vote. And George Washington, who's presiding at the time, says, no, we've already voted. This crazy going back and forth and the maneuvering of votes and all of this, this vote helped save the day because this is what allowed them to create the committee and move on. Whoops. I mentioned committees. They used a lot of committees. Um, committees were very important because you have 30 men in the room and everybody's talking. It just makes sense to get a smaller group to go out and to kind of come up with some sort of a compromise. Uh, for example, on July 2nd, I've just mentioned they had a committee um, to discuss representation in the federal legislature. And by the way, they did not settle that issue until July 16th. They kept debating it, but the point is, this is where the compromise came up. The 24th, they came up with a committee of detail. I'll speak more about that in a minute. Then they established another committee. Who's going to pay the debts of the, of the Revolutionary War? Some states still had outstanding debts. It was suggested that maybe the national government take it over. So they, had a, they created a committee to discuss that. National Taxing Authority, should the national government be allowed to tax? What about the import, importation of slaves? Should that stop or be allowed to continue? Another committee set up on trade and navigation. Then on July 31st, as they're hoping to get near the end, there's one I like to call it leftover business, just all of the details that had to be completed. The executive creating a president was extremely important. So they established a special committee for that. So committees were in constant use. And usually the committees would meet early in the morning before they, they met around. Uh, the convention would usually begin around 10 o'clock or so, adjourn in the late afternoon, 3 or 4 o'clock. And the committees would often meet. Um, in the, so the committees were extremely important. I mentioned creating the presidency. This seems so simple to us. Other than the issue of small state versus large states, creating the presidency was one of the most important and most controversial. Um, they first began talking about it early in June, but finally, as I noted, after kind of hitting at it on this day and on that day, because they were all over the map when they had these discussions and the deliberations, but finally when they created the committee in September, they really had to form some outline of what the executive would look like. Um, first of all, they distrusted executive authority. They distrusted the king. During the colonial period, the colonial governors were appointees of the king. They distrusted them. When they created the new state constitutions after the revolution, executives in the states were deliberately kept on a short leaf. They distrusted executive authority. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was no executive. Any executive duties were generally handled by some sort of a committee. And then Hamilton's proposal of a lifelong executive, that didn't help matters. But there was a question, should the executive be a single person or should it be a committee? Should this person or this committee be elected or appointed? And if they're appointed, by whom? By the state legislatures? By the national legislature? If they're elected, who should elect the president? Should it be the people of the states? Should it be the state legislatures? Should it be the national legislature? Remember, in those days, there were no political parties. There were no conventions to nominate presidents. There's no mass media. Then how long would the executive serve? For life? For a term of years? If it's a term of years, could they be reappointed or reelected? How would you remove this person? What powers would they have? They had ideas completely across the map. Uh, James Wilson was the one who argued strong for a single president, single individual, and that that person be elected by the people. Well, that was taking things a little bit too far, so eventually they came up with the concept of the Electoral College. If you determine who is going to choose the president, then the president's going to be beholden to that entity. In other words, if the state legislatures cho chose the president, well, then the president's going to be kowtowing to the state legislatures. If the national legislature chooses the president, then he's going to be kowtowing to the national legislature. So how do you make the president relatively independent? The Electoral College was one way to do that. The people 
choose the electors. The electors choose the president, but then the electors have no other function beyond that. And it's a different set of electors every four years, which creates a lot of the independence of the executive. Um, as they went through these questions, and they didn't do it just this last week in September, they were doing this all along, but this is where the immensity of the problem really came to the fore, and they had to decide. In fact, they almost broke up over this issue as well. But Pierce Butler noted in his, he was a delegate from Georgia, he noted in his remark, in his um, notes, that many of the members cast their eyes towards General Washington as president and shaped their ideas of the powers to be given to a president by their opinion of his virtue. In other words, George Washington's in the room. No one is trusted as much as him. So while they distrusted an executive, they thought this is who it's going to be. And that had a lot to do with how they made decisions regarding the presidency. Another issue that was never, quote unquote, on the agenda of the convention is what I call the studied silence. It was a very important issue, but they tried to avoid it as much as they possibly could. This is the issue of slavery. And it's an issue that continues to haunt us today. Slavery, there was never a discussion at the convention, should we abolish slavery? That was a state issue. All of the states except Massachusetts still had some form of slavery. In the North, it was different than in the South. It was smaller, it was less oppressive. Nevertheless, it was slavery. But in the South, you had an entire economy built on slavery, the plantation economy. Everyone knew that the idea of slavery was in conflict with the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. The Articles of Confederation used slavery as an accounting method for taxation and contributions to the national government. No state included in its instructions to its delegates to the convention to consider slavery, but in the debates, it kept coming up. For some, slavery was a matter of morality. For others, it was a matter of pure economics. And for others, it just wasn't an issue. Just a few comments. James Madison attacked slavery early on. He said, we have seen the mere distinction of our color made in the most enlightened period of time, a ground of the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. Yet Madison owned slaves. George Mason also owned slaves and is really the father of the Bill of Rights, said that slavery would bring down the judgment of heaven on our country. Governor Morris of Pennsylvania called slavery a nefarious institution and the curse of heaven. And then you have John Rutledge, a slave owner who said, religion and humanity has nothing to do with this question. Interest alone is the governing principle with nations. So there are many views about slavery. In the United States at this time, there were about 800,000 slaves. Most of them were in the South. Slaves accounted for about half of South Carolina's population, about 40% of Virginia's population. And of the 55 delegates who attended the convention, just under half were slave owners. And 19 of them heavily relied on slaves for the success of their plantations and their businesses. States had been trying to abolish slavery. They had been trying to limit slavery. There were abolition societies in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. And on June 11th, James Wilson proposed proportional representation, counting free inhabitants, and he included that three-fifths percentage that had been used in the Confederation Congress and the Articles of Confederation for taxation. On July 6th, they established a five-man committee created to determine apportionment among the states. We've talked about that. But then how many would each state get? If you say each state would have one per 40,000 people, well, Roger Sherman started counting it up, and he said the numbers aren't adding it up. And that caused a heated debate, first of all, about slaves. When we count the population, what about the slaves? 
Well, Elbridge Gary had an immediate objection. He said, property is not the rule of representation. In other words, we count people, we don't count property. But in the South, you count these people as property. And then he makes a statement which on its face sounds pretty harsh, but it's not. If you listen to what he's saying, property is not the rule of representation. Why should the blacks who are property in the South be in the rule of representation more than the cattle and horses of the North? In other words, we said, you count your slaves, we count our horses and our cattle. He wasn't putting down blacks. What he was saying is that's how you're treating them, the way we treat horses and cattle. And then Rufus King asked the question, well, wait a second. If we do this three-fifths thing, if we count three-fifths of the slaves for population, does that mean there's an argument for importing more slaves? So it became a major issue. Tempers mounted. Northern states said they would never support this unless there was some prohibition against future importation. As I say, tempers mounted. William Davy of North Carolina on July 12 said that North Carolina will never confederate on any terms that did not rate the slaves at least as three-fifths. If the eastern states meant to exclude them altogether, the businesses went at an end. Governor Morris said the people of Pennsylvania will never agree to a representation of Negroes as slaves by any fifths. Pierce Butler, South Carolina, the three-fifths representation of slaves is necessary as security against the possibility that their Negroes may not be taken from them. The word slave, the word slavery, never appears in the Constitution, but certain concessions were made. Three-fifths of the slaves will count as three-fifths of person for population purposes. Slave owners will pay the taxes for their slaves. Congress cannot end the slave trade or import, I'm sorry, importation until 1808. So these were accommodations that many members were very uncomfortable with, but other members absolutely insisted on. Some people say the Constitution is a document of slavery. Others will say the Constitution were the first nails in the coffin of slavery. For one thing, it stopped the importation of slaves. They were allowed to stop that on January um, 1808, and the very day that the importation of slaves could be stopped, it was stopped. There are scholars today on both sides of this issue, black scholars, white scholars, who, who see the Constitution differently. But one thing that must be said is that while slavery was wrong, and many people at that time knew that, the issue of the country at that time was not slavery, it was union. And that was the primary thing that made these compromises, in their view, necessary. Now, as I mentioned, there were many times where they weren't ready to go home. In fact, some people did go home. But just as things were really bad in the end of June, and they were arguing tempers were growing short and people were threatening to go home and threatening this, that, and the other, Benjamin Franklin stood up and he said, it's a wonderful speech, you should read the entire speech. But he said he had noticed small progress being made after four or five weeks. He said, we have felt our own lack of political wisdom. We've looked back to ancient history for models of government. We've examined different republics. We've, in, we've looked at modern states. And now groping, as it were, in the dark to find political truth we have not hitherto once thought of humbling applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding. Then he noted that at the beginning of the contest with Britain, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered. I have lived a long time, he said, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God intervenes in the affairs of men. In other words, he said, when we wrote the declaration, we were on our knees, we prayed. But here we're doing this great work and we haven't even thought about it. 
So he made a motion that every day we begin with prayer and implore the assistance of heaven. Roger Sherman of Connecticut seconded the motion, and there was a brief discussion. And I thought, well, it might have been a good thing to do early on, but now if people see all of a sudden every morning a clergyman coming and going, that's going to be a signal, oh, they're in trouble, that's why they're praying, and we don't have money to pay for a clergyman, as if the clergyman wouldn't do it for free. But nevertheless, um, they decided not to do it. Um, but everyone there said it did have a calming effect. It just made people stop and think what we are doing. So the compromises that were made during this time, federalism. Wish we could go through all of this, but we've only got a little bit of time left. Uh, a new relationship between the states and the national government. There would be a national government. It would have a president, a bicameral legislature, based on proportional representation and equality in the Senate. Um, the powers of the federal government would be enumerated. That was another big argument. What powers could the federal government have? We're going to write them down. If we write them down, we'll know what they are. Uh, problem. They didn't foresee this problem, but in the ratification conventions, they did. Article 1, Section 8 says the Congress can do this, 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 and this. And then at the bottom it says, and make all laws necessary and proper to do the foregoing things. But what's necessary? What's proper? That's a matter of opinion. Nevertheless, it's there. And it also reserves certain powers to the states. It also divided, said, these are some things that the states can do, some things the states cannot do. Here's the relationship between the states. We've already mentioned slavery, separation of powers, the executive. It created a Supreme Court, and it came up with some issues regarding commerce and how the federal government would, um, uh, would be able to regulate interstate commerce and commerce among the nation. Well, as we near the end, I like to call it the odd clauses and all the rest because there are a lot of things that are in such detail you just have to read the debates. But they had been working for two months. Re uh, rumors were circulating. At times, as I said, the convention was near collapse. At one point, it was reported in several newspapers in Connecticut and elsewhere that they were going to invite Frederick Augustus, who was the Duke of York, the second son of George III, to invite him to be king. The Pen uh, Pennsylvania packet was recording that um, the unanimity is so great that prevails in the convention and all these subjects, they're going to call it Unanimity Hall. Well, that certainly wasn't true. Several left, um, including William Patterson, who had created the New Jersey plan. He left, came back later, but it was much later. Uh, John Lansing and Robert Yates of New York left. They were mad and they wrote to Governor Clinton, they said, a central government, however guarded by declarations of rights or cautionary provisions, must inavoidably in a short time be productive of the destruction or the destruction of the civil liberty of such citizens who could effectually be in, uh, coerced by it. In other words, they said, they're creating this national government's awful, we're leaving. So for a while, there was no representation from New York. Hamilton left, these guys left, later on Hamilton came back, they never did. William Pierce left in June. He said he had a piece of business so necessary that it was unavoidable. Yeah, he, had a, he was in a duel. He owned a business and the people in England he owed money to finally sent an agent to America to collect the money. And um, they actually showed up in Philadelphia, made it public, embarrassed him. And so Pierce uh, challenged him to a duel. And the people that, to whom he owed money brought on Alexander, ha Alexander Hamilton to be their second in the duel. But fortunately, Alexander Hamilton worked the deal out and the duel never happened. But I guess that was an important matter that took him away. So finally, they created the Committee of Detail. And here we get down near the end. The Committee of Detail was to take all of these resolutions, all of these things that they had passed and voted on, some were contradictory of each other, and they said, we've got all of these votes. We've got to put them in some kind of a fashion where they're understandable. So they spent 11 days, they took an 11-day uh, recess, 
while others went on vacation or went back to New York and so on. Um, 11 days of work, they took all of this information and came back with 23 resolutions. They did things like calling the House of Representatives the House of Representatives, naming the executive the president, um, and giving him powers of the veto and to be commander in chief. They proposed that specific list of enumerated powers I mentioned. Uh, they came up with that catchphrase of what is necessary and proper. They created the judiciary. In other words, they took all of this work that had been done and finally put it together in some sort of a coherent docu document. Copies were printed with wide margins, distributed to the members so that they could take notes. Uh, they reported out on August 6th, and so we see another month of argument and discussion, but at least they have something to work on. Finally, on September 8th, the convention created a committee of style and arrangement. And they said, take all the work that the Committee of Detail did, all the changes we've made as the Committee of the Whole in the convention, put this into a real document. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison were on that committee, which is important because later they wrote the Federalist Papers. It was chaired by Gouverneur Morris. And that's a name, not a title. He was from Pennsylvania. And on September 12th, they submitted the final draft. And it's basically the draft we know today. Seven articles, preamble, and a closing endorsement. And they also drafted a letter that would accompany the Constitution when it was sent to the Confederation Congress um, as the final draft. Interestingly enough, Governor Morris, who basically did most of this work of this committee, made a major change that almost nobody noticed at that time, but it sure got noticed in the ratification conventions. The original preamble the Committee of Detail had written said the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and so on. They named the people of, they named the states. Governor Morris changed that and just said, we the people. Later on, people such as um, uh, Patrick Henry said, where did they get the right to say we the people instead of we the states and list the states? The point is, they've now got this final document. On September 13th and 14th, it's officially engrossed, put on the parchment paper. And then on September 15th, it's given the unanimous approval of the state delegations. By the way, there was only one member from New York there at that time, Alexander Hamilton. So September 17th, they signed the Constitution. It was signed by 39 men from 12 states. One member, John Dickinson, was ill, so he asked another member to sign for him. Three members refused to sign. One of them was Randolph, the very man who had offered the Virginia plan on the first day of the convention. Another was Elbridge Gary. Elbridge Gary was one of the ones who spoke most of the time from Massachusetts. He voted no. And so did George Mason, who, as I said, was eventually became the father of the Bill of Rights. They didn't like there were a number of reasons. George Mason had about 16 reasons. But the major reasons that they gave was they did not like the fact there was no Bill of Rights. George Washington said, we don't need one. Because if, you, if the Constitution doesn't say you can do something, you can't do it. Others were saying they didn't trust that. They wanted a real declaration of rights. And as we'll see in the next lecture, we'll learn a lot about the ratification process and how this became very important. The first one to sign was George Washington, and then they signed, again, by state, north to south. It was first published in the Pennsylvania packet the next day, and then by September 20th, it was received by Congress, and then on September 28th, the Congress, this would be the Confederation Congress, sent the Constitution to the states to be ratified. And we'll close with this last slide. What you see here is the chair that the presiding officer sat during the convention. What you see in the middle is the carving on the back of that chair. And there's sort of a half sunray. And then you see there in the picture, Benjamin Franklin 
um, signing. But Benjamin Franklin said, and he, he records this, Madison records this beautifully in his notes. He said, as the delegates proceeded one by one to sign, Franklin, looking toward the president's chair, at the back of which a rising sun happened to be painted. Franklin observed to a few members near him, the painters had found it difficult to uh, distinguish in their art whether this was a rising or a setting sun. I have, said Franklin, often in the course of the session and the vicissitudes of my hopes and fears as to its issue, looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was a rising or a setting sun. But now at length, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. And when he signed, Benjamin Franklin said, this document is not perfect, never will be, but because we're human, but it's the best that we can do, and he wholeheartedly supported. In our next lecture, we're going to look at how the states ratified the Constitution. And if the convention was raucous at time, we need to hear about the ratification conventions. Thank you. Thank you, Joellen. So we have one question, and it references back to uh, Massachusetts being the only state that had outlawed slavery already. How did that come about? That is a great question. Um, Massachusetts outlawed slavery in a diff very different way. They had written, like all the states had, a brand new constitution right after the revolution. And the Constitution that they finalized in 1780 had a phrase in it that all men are born and created equal. And there was a woman by the name of Mum Bet. She was a house slave in Boston, Massachusetts. And right in the middle of the Revolutionary War, as she is serving food and, and um, taking care of guests in the home of this family, um, she hears about liberty. She hears about freedom and rights. She knows about this new Massachusetts Constitution, and she got to thinking, wait a minute, um, the Constitution says all men are born free and equal, but how come I'm not? So she literally had the temerity and the courage to hire an attorney. She hired an attorney by the name of Theodore Sedgwick, who actually became one of the first members of the new Congress um, uh, representing Massachusetts, and she said, here's the Constitution, here's my situation, I want to sue for my freedom, I want you to be my lawyer. He took her case. And in those days, juries were composed of only men, only white men, and they found unanimously in her favor. There were a couple, and so she won her freedom. A couple of years uh, later, there were a couple of other similar cases, and finally the Massachusetts Supreme Court said in a definitive case, that slavery is inconsistent with the Constitution of the state of Massachusetts, all because of one woman who had the courage to stand up for what she believed in and a group of people who believed with her. By the way, with, with her new freedom, she ended up being able to pick a job and earn wages. She ended up working for the Sedgwick family as a free woman, earning wages, worked for them the rest of her life and is buried in their family grave. So Mum Bet, a courageous woman in history. Thanks for the question. Of course, uh, that's the only question I have. Thank you.